Okay, so far so good. So I'm going to do introduce the guests here at Laboral. So I will start uh, here to my left, Pablo de Soto, who is a scholar. He is an experimental architect and multidisciplinary artist. He has been a part of the group Our Architecture. That is when I discovered him. It is a group of activists and programmers and architects uh, responsible for many projects in the framework of public space, also a movement uh, related to the 15th uh, March, and also the geopolitics. I think you have just published a paper on that topic, right? Uh, with uh, some data related to architecture or that is what I saw on your website. Right now, he's working as a professor at the Federal University of Paraíba in Brazil. He was born in Gijón, and in fact, he has a close relationship with Laboral because he was the first uh, winner of the award of young um, ex, um, well, um, experimental um, workers here in Laboral. So we welcome him and we'd like to him to tell us what happens when one of the main digital platforms uh, is introduced here in Asturias. David Cabo here to my left is a co-founder and co-director of Fundación Ciudadana Civio. He is an engineer, a computing engineer. He could have made a lot of money in the field of manipulation and surveillance and however he found it together with Eva del Monte, the Foundation Ciudadana Civio, independent and non-profit organization uh, that does something that newspapers do not do, that is to get away from statements and to try to bring to light the data many times through, well, uh, many uh, uh, complaints filed. And uh, he has many projects. Uh, for example, uh, Donde Van Mis Impuestos, uh, which is a platform to visualize the budget of public administration, the Indultometro, very popular, and analysis of all the indults uh, in Spain since 1996. They have done a lot of research of uh, public uh, contracts, for example, Quien Cobra la Obra, uh, Documenta Mentalia that is uh, related to health access and now they are trying to access the data of uh, funds of the power companies, a very hot uh, potato topic. And then we have also Pinar Yordas uh, for her, uh, Pilar Yordas is three o'clock in the morning. Pinar is an architect, artist and interdisciplinary uh, researcher her work uh, well has been uh, implemented in Turkey and in USA. Now she is joint professor at the University of San Diego, California. She depends in the relationship uh, between digital technologies and sciences. She calls it a speculative uh, biology and generates spaces uh, that have to do also with feminist agnoscience. Uh, uh, her work is uh, most popular work, has different manifestations, installations, etc., etc. It is called Ecosystem of Excess, where she imagines a world mastered by species that have learned how to digest plastic and live off plastic, whereas we human beings have been extincted because we have only been able to produce plastic but not to uh, digest it or, or, or we still do not know how to use it. So it is a very imaginative uh, project. Three imaginaries that are very different. I have three very different approaches to explore or to try to interpret the world with different uh, ways, in different ways, because human beings interpret the world through the stories that we tell, the narratives. Uh, we tell stories to be able to survive, if you wish. So I will first start uh, here uh, with Pablo. Pablo was telling me before that right now he's interested in what has happened or what is happening when Amazon 
uh, well, uh, sets up a plant, a production center in Asturias. Yes, thank you very much, Marta, for the introduction. Thank you very much to Elena and Patricia for, from Laboral for having invited me to be here this morning. Uh, yes, to reply to your question, I would like to highlight something that you and Daniel mentioned that has to do with technological uh, revolution. No? Uh, for example, what kind of policies that are programmed by the uh, AI, the risks to be assumed by who, and I don't know who said that the feasibility of a technology or democracy depends on the practice of justice and the establishment of uh, limits to the power abuse. And Crawford, who is like a reference no, in these topics, says in his book, Atlas of AI, that suggests in democratizing AI to reduce power symmetries is like uh, trying to argument uh, uh, or democratization of weapons uh, is focused or, or is at the service of peace. Yes. And here we have the problem of, of the big technological powers. No, Gafano is called by the French people. Uh, they are the ones who most invest in R plus D on AI. An example here in Asturias is Amazon, that is like a, a, a big craft uh, with a big uh, well, a plant uh, here, like 25 kilometers away from here in the municipality of Sierra. What has happened uh, in terms of a democratic analysis, if we think that urban laws are part of our democratic system, our social contract, that uh, guarantee the space uh, justice. Um, Amazon uh, has uh, worked so that the urban permit, uh, well, that usually takes eight months to get, uh, it has only taken them eight weeks, no, imagine. Or Amazon, for example, has increased the margin of the building uh, square meters of that uh, plant, of that plot. It is also known how democracy is not as such when the military power equals the government. In that sense, it is a strike, and I'd like to read you one of the specifications of the job offer in Asturias that says that for the manager of uh, technologies, uh, you need even military, for example, experience. Radical law is one of the main guarantees, democratic guarantees or rights, and it is also documented how Amazon uh, has uh, implemented very aggressive practices in states. I just wanted to frame the, the, the case of uh, Amazon and in the framework of AI, artificial intelligence. Yeah, it is interesting how we're selling as AI a center of exploitation of people, no persons. In the case of Amazon, it's very paradigmatic, if you wish. Contact of workers of Amazon with AI is that the boss is an algorithm. It is not that it is an algorithm learning things from them, but rather it is a tablet that they carry and that tells them where things are located. And as the warehouse of Amazon, that is where they uh, well, store products that then we buy through Amazon Prime and they deliver for free, they are placed in such a way that they facilitate work to machines, not to people. So the same as if you go to a shopping center, according less, uh, you have all the toys in one corridor and all the kitchenware in another level separated from the, I don't know, glasses, no, that they are somewhere else. So they follow a logic order, if you wish, no, for us, for human beings. We find it very, very reasonable, no? You, you go to kitchen to one place, uh, to clothing to another place, but in Amazon, everything is organized uh, uh, as uh, products that are uh, bought together for whatever reason. So socks are mixed with pots and saucepans, whatever. And people who work there do not find a logic as for where things are located. And they have to find them through their tablet. And the tablet tells them, go to corridor uh, three, um, shell five, whatever. It's just like if you go to Ikea, not to, to buy things. But also 
they measure the time they are moving around. So if all of a sudden they stop, the tablet tells them, well, you are getting paid per hour. So it is a regime of abuse that is so opposed to the promise of robots that come to generate the warehouse without workers, the plant without workers, so on and so forth. So I insist these are not AI systems, but they're rather systems that manage people, human beings, and they are not facilitating the work of the worker, but rather it makes it harder. Well, Another issue in terms of Amazon is that we lose the story. Now, uh, we think that Amazon is going to generate wealth, create jobs, etc., etc. And no, what Amazon does is to decrease the, the, the life or the, or the quality of life of the worker. They do not uh, pay taxes here or in Europe. And Amazon usually locates the plants where power is cheaper and, and permits are cheaper. Etc. Etc. They do not come to places that seem to be promising, but rather the, where they can get everything. So they come here just to consume resources without generating any. And one of the problems is that we do not have access to those data. Uh, we do not know how much they pay for the property, etc. Etc. And this happens with many businesses in Spain. And thinking about algorithms, David. How can we talk about algorithm democracy in a world where you do not have access to data that should be public? And how do you manage, uh, no, in Sirium, in Civio, in your company, to have access to, to data on funding um, to power companies? Because we know nothing about this. Yes, of course. It is complex. It is not easy to get data. For those of us who do not know us, Civio is a non-profit organization. It is what we call as data research or data journalism. We extract information from public companies uh, so that they are more transparent and, and that there is a greater control by a third party. And this is what Marta mentioned uh, at the beginning. And we try to, well, uh, look at the legislation framework now that uh, kind of protects us. In terms of the topic of this panel, AI, there is something that is called a social bonus or a social uh, uh, bonus or a primer for some families that do not have a, a high income, they can have some help to pay for the power. We identify that this program that uh, should well get to four or five million of uh, families in Spain that have some problems to pay for power. However, only between one or 10 percent of people are really accessing this discount. Why? Because the process is too complicated and there was a program in the middle that decided that if your application form, well, application form, you do not send it directly to the government, but rather to your power company. They do not care if they give you the discount or no, of course. And it is a very complex system, and we try to help uh, uh, citizens you now also help them by, by trying to simplify the forms, how to fill in the forms, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And you have to take into account as well that this uh, funding uh, targeting elderly or people with a low income or very low level of education, uh, people who, well, have a fewer skills now to handle all these forms. And the NMC, they also had problems to understand the process. So it is a very complicated process, no? So when we started to work with the families, with the citizens to try to help them out with our calculator, the problem is that this program, that is another example on how a traditional processes are digitalized, how the processes of uh, fund granting uh, become electronic uh, processes. There is a program making the decision instead of a civil worker deciding whether or not they're going to give you that money, that uh, discount or that fund. There is a program that makes the decision whether yes or no, you get the discount. So looking at all these issues and um, pro um, problems, we fabricated, quote unquote, an online calculator. Mm. 
we asked, uh, started to ask about uh, for information about this program, making decisions, and after many months working on this and asking for more and more information, uh, we were able to demonstrate and prove that there were problems embedded in the program making the decisions. And some people who had the right to that funding, the program was rejecting that funding. And that generated or resulted in many problems uh, to those citizens that had problems even filling in the form. All of a sudden, they get a letter uh, that says, well, the program cannot decide. I'm so sorry. And for us, uh, well, that was very important, no? But to try to cut it short, uh, the problem of all these things is that even a process that at the beginning seems very simple, once it is automated and the machine is taking making the decision, They start saying the excuses, no? They give us excuses, well, that is technology. Well, that is another thing. We cannot explain that. Even at the, at, at the court, you know, some people came and said that this is an issue of national security. They cannot give us the code. They cannot give us further information because then everybody could access that information and know what the um, neighbor is charging, for example, or the discount given to the neighbor. So we're going back to the very beginning of the transformation of processes, where up to now, uh, well, you were protected by a law, and then you just went to see the civil worker face to face, and you got some questions, and everything is becoming a, a black box, if you wish. No algorithm says no, that's it. And uh, we're a bit concerned about this issue. And also there is a discourse uh, related to what you mentioned at the beginning, that AI does not exist. Uh, there is a discourse and uh, kind of, well, this will be very difficult. You will never understand it. And I am here to say this is not so difficult. You have some rights as a citizen, the right to get to know information. Uh, and those are your rights, and you have to enjoy those rights. Uh, so our fear or our concern in terms of democracy and AI, artificial intelligence, is that everybody is excluded and people say, well, this is only for experts and not for the common um, citizen. Or if the machine has said this, it cannot be wrong. Are you going to know more than the machine? No way. So the feeling is of false or fake objectivity. I don't know whether I am answering your question, but the problem is that traditional mechanisms that were already working very badly when getting information on public uh, contracts, funding, etc., etc. In Spain, it is a torture, it's a nightmare. And you have been working on that for many, many years until you get to court to try to get some information. This is already working very badly. And once you introduce all of a sudden AI, when there is a machine, all in the middle, everybody raised their hands and said, ah, this is a black box. Ah, I don't understand this. Ah, this is what the machine says. That's it. And this is uh, very concerning, no? Because instead of making things more simple, they are transforming things into black boxes. Nobody wants to assume responsibility. And it seems that the decision was made by the machine. It wasn't me. Now, this is my watch that is getting activated. <laughs> Very timely. Yeah, yeah. The problem. It's what I was mentioning. It seems that nobody is making decisions when those bo black boxes were designed by a legislator or a civil worker. Yes, that is what Castanel. Uh, refers to as the weapons of mathematical destruction. Because here we have a kind of a double trump, if you wish. When you offer a solution, an algorithm solution to a problem, that in fact it is not such a problem. For example, that there is some money uh, for those families that, that need some help and the government does not want to give them the money. This is not an algorithm problem. It is very easy to give them the money if they need it, no? 
But the problem of the uh, black box is the algorithm has decided yes or no, and that is like the lead, if you wish, that uh, prevents you from uh, pursuing things that you could pursue, as for example, gender discrimination, discrimination on the basis of religion, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, because if it is an algorithm, uh, well, you think that it is right, no? And it has done the things very transparently, you know, with transparency. Uh, my example is the following. When some years ago, a guy was taken out of an aircraft of United Airlines. I don't know whether you remember, he was just dragged out of the airplane because, uh, well, two, two guys on the same airplane were recording that video, you know? And he was bleeding on the face and everything because he did not want to leave the, the aircraft. And United Airlines said, well, we had overbooking. This is not a technical problem. Uh, all of a sudden, well, they, 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 they can have another hostess no, who has to connect with, an, with another flight and she's there and she has to pay for it. So they offered him a, a, a room uh, at a hotel for free but nobody wanted eh, to leave the aircraft. And the algorithm chose this gentleman to leave the aircraft. And the guy said, no, no, I don't want to leave the aircraft. And they dragged him out because he did not want to leave the aircraft eh, because he had the right to be there because he had paid for that ticket. And they said, well, the algorithm had chosen this gentleman and the algorithm is playing uh, uh, two roles. First, that it is not the hostess who leaves the aircraft because then you may go into uh, uh, a legal uh, problem, no? Because they, they, uh, maybe, well, the, the they can say, well, they chose this guy because he was gentleman and that is racism, for example. So algorithm is very neutral and that is good. But then when they say it was uh, an algorithm uh, uh, decision, it is as if it was a clean decision, transparent decision. The algorithm is uh, choosing the least valuable person of the aircraft, someone who does not fly very often, or maybe that has paid very little for that uh, air ticket, or someone who does not have a gold card. Eh? So those are the data handled by the algorithm. The algorithm is covering the, pro the, the the objective of the process. That is, you drag out someone of the, of out of the airplane, but without getting into a mess. Yes, and a private company well faces other problems. We we work with the public entities now, and for us it is unacceptable. You cannot not assume your responsibility as a civil worker and say, well, that is a, the machine's decision, and that's it. If in the end a process or a machine is deciding whether or not you're going to have a discount in that power bill, you need to know information on the basis of what you got or you did not get that discount. Some people say, no, because it's very difficult, it's very complex, uh, that is all done by the machine. And that's why they do not want to publish the taxes you have to pay, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. If laws are public, all well, that information should be public. Another topic or another topic for discussion is the following. Machine learning, ML, it is like a money laundering, but with a bias, no? You can have some historical data, but with some kind of bias, for example, police data, and then you give those data or feed the machine with those data, and then you are perpetuating, per, uh, well, kind of continuing a bias, but it is not your bias, but it is the bias of the machine. So you are kind of ignoring your responsibility and passing that responsibility onto the machine. For us, that is unacceptable. Yeah, that is what they call mash washing, no? Uh, the, the, the washing of laundry with mathematics. Yeah, one of the things that for me are characteristics of our time is the opacity of the processes and even the paradoxes posed by the processes that the world uh, makes less and less sense because the decisions are made now by black boxes that do not make sense. 
And the result of it all is a feeling of life in competency, uh, generating some very negative uh, mental mindsets, no? It is like, well, I do not understand anymore the world I live in. I cannot operate in this world. I cannot live in this world because I do not understand it. And this is related to the fact that we cannot imagine futures that are not this topic, non-apocalyptic futures. And in this case, I think the work by Pinar, Hello Pinar, is especially interesting because what she does is to use, she uses data that are available to everybody, but to generate mental spaces that are much more related to the materiality of the world we live in, with the biological aspects of our context. And on the basis of that, we can imagine new worlds, uh, worlds that do not incorporate us, in that sense, it reminds me of the works by Remini Protocol or Superflux. But please, Pinar, maybe you can tell us something about your work. Why is it so difficult to imagine non-dystopic futures? And how can we start uh, telling new stories or narratives about who we are, our planet, and what we can do in the future? Thank you. Uh, can you, so do I speak in English and can you hear me okay when I speak? I'm sorry, it's a little bit of a weird setup for me. Yes, so I can we can hear you. Here. Okay, great. Now, uh, thank you so much. And I've been following uh, with the translation. So this is a very, very exciting discussion, actually. Um, one thing that I want to mention is that uh, there are, of course, always other ways that are not this topic to approach these uh, topics. Oh, yeah. They're like uh, various ways of uh, creating narratives. Um, as much as I've been, um, you know, imagining, for instance, uh, as you mentioned in the beginning, my uh, one of my works and ecosystem of excess, uh, I imagine what we could think of as a darker future. Uh, actually, uh, it's only from a more anthropocentric perspective that it gets dark because uh, the whole idea is that um, the ocean is full of plastics and then uh, life evolves to, you know, uh, live off of plastics. Uh, so perhaps there's no uh, space left for the mankind or humankind, but there's plenty of space for new creatures to emerge. So it really depends on where you're looking at this, like uh, whose perspective you're taking. But um, to kind of come closer to this notion of AI and where we're headed with it, I, uh, I wanted to bring up another work that I uh, have been you know, working on. And uh, since I guess 2015, 16, uh, the Kitty AI, uh, who happens to be in the background uh, here uh, with Zoom, uh, which is an uh, artificial intelligence overlord that governs a European city. And in a work like this, I just wanted to kind of push the question to the limit, uh, you know, okay, uh, automation and AI are already, you know, super active in how we live our lives. So as this is a global phenomenon that's already happening, there's so many artificial intelligences that are invisible to us, they're already at work. But what if, you know, AI starts uh, gaining positions or uh, getting, um, let's say, a, a certain type of social status that wasn't available to it before, such as, you know, uh, roles in governance and ultimately uh, like a leader, like an AI becoming a world leader. Of course, I was inspired by um, Watson by IBM, which was, you know, kind of becoming more and more popular around 2015, 16. And as I kept watching the ads for uh, Watson and how you know it's integrated in um, education, transportation, fabrication, like all kinds of healthcare, like, you know, there's this big premise that Watson's gonna be there for us to build our data-driven uh, future. But at the same time, um, the question is um, basically one about who gets to have this power, right? Uh, when we have something like uh, Watson that can process 
all this data that wasn't able to be processed before. And um, then another thing that grabbed my attention was uh, the fact that most AIs, you know, I'm not talking about their uh, literary or, um, you know, Hollywood representation, but most of them that we actively see uh, do not have, uh, for instance, uh, a face or uh, a way through which an interface through which we can uh, perhaps, you know, humanize them. So I was really thinking about the lack of emotion in AI's research, uh, how effective computing would change the way uh, we interact with AI. And honestly, um, back to your question, and I think I'm going to stop after that. If we are to imagine a less dark world, right, um, then uh, I think the path that involves emotion and the path uh, in computing, of course, I'm talking about design of uh, artificial intelligences and how we're moving forward with them, designs and approaches where we actually, um, you know, give them um, other uh, thinking cap capacities uh, would be the only path for uh, perhaps a more comprehensive, more realistic and less dark version of it. Yes, thank you so much, Pinar. I'd like to ask you, all of you, thinking again about what Pinar has just mentioned. No, Pinar was offering uh, that kit, you know, new entities to imagine futures mastered by uh, AI and that are less threatening than the futures we can think of right now, no? And they offer other options, no? More emotional, emo uh, emotional futures, no? Instead of those of Amazon, no? For example, and those workers. And I would like you to tell me, how do you imagine or rather, what are the transforming ways in which in your disciplines, architecture, data analysis, uh, journalism, which way art could push forward those new realities, those new futures Pinar mentioned, no? What could we do so that that world dominated or mediated by um, IA is less threatening and more creative? Well, we have gone into the happy passion world, no? which is much more entertaining. I would like to share with you a slide, maybe you can show it, that illustrates a little bit uh, the question of uh, how IA can well uh, help us create a new world, no? more positive. Some examples, the first one is the one of uh, mounted democracy that comes from the MIT. It is a fascinating entity, but also a problematic idea. The idea that we can have some kind of digital twins. It is like an assembly eh, with those votes, uh, kind of a software players that would be trained to be our virtual representation at the assemblies, at the parliaments. So our uh, appointed uh, representative would uh, be trained to vote because they would know exactly what we think about anything they are handling. This is happening at the stock exchange. At the stock exchange, there are no people shouting eh, on the phone. Yeah, and what is interesting about this project that is about to, to be launched is that they say that the algorithm used for those predictions would be chosen by each user in a free market, a market free, open of algorithms. This is very interesting, no? that the population uh, will learn about these topics, no? that it's not so simple. So this has to do with pedagogy. And Remini Protocol also puts into practice as an interactive theater what could be the mental democracy with that project called Stage, they imagine humanity as the cloud of IA that has been able to reduce environmental problems, reduce violence, etc., etc. Another example, more related to Spain, the importance of technopolitical spaces where you give response to some questions on why technology and how. 
uh, we have a project called the CD by the CV by the CD uh, in Barcelona. 11,700 proposals, and they are seeing how to use IA to improve the system of open code. How participatory budgets could be optimized by using algorithms. They already implemented a pilot project at the example with 500,000 million euros, and thanks to that algorithm, they, well, made a better use of that money. It is a very small project, a very small experience, but I think it's very useful. No? And it, there is a, a clear need of uh, human labs, no? a spaces with human beings, uh, social interaction, social relationships. Like for example, Mediana Prado, who works on these topics in Spain, here in Laboral, Many years ago, we implemented a project similar to this, a kind of space created to make urban decisions in a more uh, democratic way. The CVIN is working on a level of code, but they also have a kind of a digital code that uh, takes advantage of the figure of the Ateneo of the 21st century, but uh, in a digital way. We need to get all together to learn about these algorithms. Yes, this fits in with uh, your project called Where Do My Taxes Go To? No? I remember one year The Guardian also illustrated something uh, in this regard, no? where all the money collected went to, no? all the uh, taxes. Access to data in UK, I think, is greater. They have a transparency law that is very strict, and you do not need to go to court no? to get information on data, public data. I'd like to ask you, and we only have seven minutes left, uh, what are the tools of AIA that could assist you to provide the citizenship with more data? What tools do you have at hand no? uh, to try to forget what the politician is saying or telling and to tell really what they are doing? No? What are the tools that we could use or we could make up or we could invent or maybe someone is using these tools in an effective way so the citizens are better informed? I think that for citizens to be well informed, uh, we need uh, the journalism. Ten years ago, there was a kind of a utopia. Uh, people said, well, with open data, people would go home and start inspecting and looking into data and data, data. That's not true. You get home and you're tired and just have, just have a beer, right? But uh, there should be an entity, or for example, us, uh, who could uh, look into those data. So that is where our struggle goes to. We need the raw material to uh, investigate. So for example, if you are concerned about the warehouse of Amazon, you should be able to collect those data. Okay, so we want the raw material to be there for everybody. I am a computing expert, and I think IA has uh, to play a role, but there is a bubble as well, no? Uh, because some people think that this is kind of magic, and sometimes the algorithms are stupid, and they can only do one thing. But uh, what is of our concern is that sometimes uh, uh, the administration takes us as well. We do not want uh, citizens to trick us when they are asking for funding, no. Well, they, they gather all the information, and they could send you a letter and say, hey, we can see that you have a very low income and you have a right to this funding. No, they should help you, no, instead of putting barriers and uh, making the walls uh, higher, if you wish. Because, for example, in other countries, they are doing it, no? they are approaching the citizen, for example, the poor citizen who needs more money. We should deploy the technology in that sense. For example, we have also found out that there well, were many 
there were many funds or, or there was a lot of funding that was given to friends of civil workers, for example, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, no? So this technology is not deployed to reveal all this corruption, but rather you're only using this technology to put more and more barriers to the citizens now. So you should try to make or fabricate or manufacture a kind of a machine assistant not to help the citizens. That is my utopia. Yeah, but that is a problem that is kind of more technical because, for example, the Treasury has an automated system to find you. For example, if you have uh, presented your tax uh, report one day later, no? And then all of a sudden, they do not know about people who are taking a lot of money to other countries now or to, uh, yeah, and that is a political problem. Of course, we need the will to deploy the technology uh, in a way that favors citizens. And Pinar, finally, I'd like to ask you and to close this panel. And thank you very much. I know it is 3 a.m. for you. Thank you so much for being with us or um, for being awake for us, right? I'd like to ask you, Pinar, what are the main aspects of your KDIA that improve life of people? Sure. Sure. Uh, so the, the really important thing about uh, Kitty AI as opposed to others is that uh, the Kitty AI can love uh, the citizens in its database. So think of it this way. Uh, there are certain, I wouldn't call them primitive, but um, AI driven emotions that Kitty uh, feels for its citizens. So the connection is not really a political one but it becomes more of a personal collection. Moreover, the Kitty AI is always there, uh, kind of like an assistant or also uh, like the big brother watching you. So there's, it's always collecting data from the citizens through mobile apps or internet of things. So um, if this is used properly, the good things that can happen is that as soon as the data is generated, the government can act upon it. And of course, uh, there can be so many sinister applications of this. But when I was envisioning Kitty AI, I was thinking about things such as if uh, the air pollution, the air quality in a certain neighborhood is, you know, decreasing. And this, if this is visible to the Kitty, perhaps the Kitty AI can take act. No. La perdimos, a Pinar. Espero que momentáneamente. La perdimos. We lost you. Huh. We did. Bueno, esto que dice me parece so, en cualquier course, caso it, I, muy interesante. Okay. Aquí estás. Yeah, what is she's it, saying is very interesting. Here she is. You're here again, Pinar. We lost you for a minute. She's lost again. Well, her Kitty IA, her model of uh, algorithm governance, has the capacity to love, has emotions, capacity that many members of the Congress have lost, so that would be an improvement. And it reminds me of the famous poem by Curtis for the documentary that used to be the dream of the 70s that we all were not so much observed by those machines without any kind of bias uh, with good intentions and capable or making a world that is so efficient that we do not have to work anymore. I don't know whether that is the most utopic future we may imagine. Here we have already said that most of the technical problems we have to get get to that better future are not technical issues, but rather political issues, and they are linked to opacity. Unfortunately, we have to leave it here. It is already 2.30 here in Spain, and uh, I'm really sorry we lost Pinar, but thank you very much, Laboral, for having organized such an interesting seminar. Thank you, Elena and Patricia, for having gathered us here to talk about topics that are and will be very interesting and relevant and outstanding 
in the years to come, and we have to address them because the empire of black bosses are not good for us. It's not good for us at all. Thank you very much, and uh, we will see you all at the next event organized by Laboral. Thank you very much, David and Pablo, for being here, and thank you, Pinar. Thank you.